I'd like, to, I'd like to welcome you all to a, a very interesting evening we hope to have to discuss the launch of two books and uh, the, the partial completion of a very interesting film that we're going to have a chance to look at. Um, Wade Davis sends his apologies. He's, uh, he's, he's trapped in Colombia at the moment uh, and, uh, and was unable to join us this evening. He sends his regrets. Um, and we're waiting, on, uh, we're waiting on, on, on Gabor. I think that he's going to be arriving shortly. Um, am I speaking far enough away from this microphone? Great. Um, this evening marks the culmination of a, of a several year long process in which uh, Bia Lavache and uh, Clancy Kavner uh, worked uh, tirelessly to put together um, what I think of as uh, one of the most interesting and certainly novel uh, scholarly approaches to thinking about the history and practice of peyotism, both in the United States and Mexico, that I've I've ever read. I think the first chapter is particularly uh, brilliant. Uh, <laughs> actually, I, I'm, a number of us are in it. Um, a number, a number of the people who are presenting tonight uh, are going to present work that was in this text. I, I, act, I was, I was fortunate enough to, to, to uh, uh, what is the word? Contribute one of the chapters to this text. Um, we have only uh, one artifact available for you. You're welcome to come up and touch it at the end of the evening. Um, but if you wish to purchase it. Oh, they actually have copies of it outside? Oh, there are copies of it for sale outside, and if they run out of copies, if, they, if you buy a copy outside this evening, we'll all sign it um, in, in one another's names. Um, and uh, I, um, Erica is also going to be talking about, a, uh, this is Erica Dick over here from the Press from the University of Saskatchewan. She's going to be talking both about her contribution here, but also a, a, a book that she has just finished and is due out in two weeks. Um, and she will tell you how you can, you can order it on Amazon or your local distributors, um, your local book distributors. Um, we're going we're gonna to give uh, each of the speakers about 15 minutes to talk about whatever it is that they want to talk about. And at the end of their presentations, we will sort of gather for a kind of common question and answer session about this project, about the, the larger politics and practice of, of peyotism in, in, the, in the contemporary world. So we're going to start. We're going to start um, with Bia. Bia, if you would come up and uh, onward and upward. Um, should I? Or I, if you can just be wherever you are. So. Um, Good, good evening, everybody. I just want to start by saying how honored I feel to be here and what a privilege. Um, Alec, I met him virtually a couple of years ago, and he has always been this wonderful, gentle man and colleague and friend and has given incredible support for me um, to organize this book and all the, you know, several processes that it involved. And so it's a small, humble event that uh, brings together, brings up this result of years of collaboration, virtual interaction. Also, Erica Dick, we have been collaborating uh, without knowing each other for several years. So it's such an honor and privilege to to meet these colleagues and to be here tonight. Also with Ellen, with whom I'm doing uh, this new project of a a film. She's going to talk more about it. I, I, I just want to give some general overview of what is, what is this book, like a kind of appetizer, and then, you know, hope to encourage you to, to, to read the book. If you, if you can't afford it, maybe you can talk to me and I can share some of the materials. Uh, this, this intends to give a general overview of what it was, why we did it, and what it's about, but we're not going to go into details on the content uh, at this opportunity. So I just want to start saying that this book is co-edited uh, with my dear friend and collaborator, Clancy Kavner, who's from San Francisco and is not here today. She's an editor, a psychologist, and also an artist. She's a super talented artist. She drew the cover. It's this peyote here was uh, drawn by her, especially for, for the cover of her book. This book was, this uh, publisher was picked by me because uh, they edited a book that I'm a total fan, which is Psychedelic Medicines by Tom Roberts and uh, Michael Wilkeman. Uh, it's Prager ABC Clio. That's why we chose this publisher. They also have another um, 
series of, of publications on this area. So the book is um, composed of 12 chapters. Uh, it has 16 authors. The, the forward is done by Stacey Schaffer and Jim Ball, who are very important references uh, in this, in this um, field. And the book is about peyote, this rare cactus, this small cactus, this mysterious plant that is both the subject of rejection, fascination, uh, uh, as we were talking with Alec this, after, this, this in, in, during lunch of, of both awe and disgust, it's a, it's a cactus that has been much uncomprehended and much talked about. It has played a role in different areas of um, human existence from you know, indigenous uh, identity and ethnicity and politics to a role in counterculture, in literature, in theater, uh, going through another therapeutic dimension in a popular pharmacopoeia or potentials uh, to treat um, drug-related problems, alcoholism. It has advanced religious legislation in this, the United States through the you know, issue of peyote, one of the most important um, pieces of legislation in the US uh, came about, which is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So it's a small cactus with a long history. It's also one of the substances that has larger history in humankind documented. There's uh, evidence at at least 6,000 years use of peyote. So there's large um, historical background for this species that is a rare species, that is a fragile species that grows endogenously just in s small parts of the world. Uh, so, you know, its, its existence is multiple, its voices are multiple, its context of use is multiple. My personal relationship to this topic is that I come from the studies uh, of sacred plants, shamanism, uh, religion, so I, I kind of look at religious, traditional, sacramental, medicinal drug use, and particularly have focused a lot on ayahuasca, which is a vine from the Amazon that is pretty trendy nowadays. I'm Brazilian. I went several times to the Amazon. I did master's, PhD, everything about ayahuasca. When I got into Mexico, it was just kind of natural, as we say in Portuguese. You know, monkeys like bananas. Like, I just, uh, <laughs> it was a natural focus of interest for me to, to get interested in peyote, which is a kind of cousin of ayahuasca. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a relative of ayahuasca from the so-called family one, <laughs> schedule, schedule one <laughs> drugs. <laughs> Uh, it's considered, uh, for, you know, it's scheduled as uh, uh, the highest level of danger, which is the schedule. And I was interested in peyote because of this ritual use, this historical use, this multiple, you know, varied insertion in, in Mexican history, but also because of more profane and mundane and day-to-day -day reasons, which is also a, a little curiosity and anecdote. It's good to be an anthropologist that you can tell a lot of anecdotes and that's okay, it's part of your research. I just, I don't eat meat and I got into this like semi-desert place of Mexico, Aguas Calientes, where I lived two years. I was suffering a lot without options of non-meat food. I also don't like very um, spicy food, so I was being a hard, you know, a hard sociable person. And they started to give me a lot of cactus to eat. Uh, so I started to eat a lot of nopal, and I made this joke that I was overdosed by nopal, and I don't do any nopals anymore because I ate like six months of nopals. Eating nopals opened my mind to the world of cactus, which is the multiple lives of cactus in, 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 and stories of cactus in Mexico and in population. We have this um, stereotype of cactus in Mexico. To me, this stereotype was really uh, a reality that I got to, to know how, how many uses of cactus exist in daily life. Multiple cactus, so you have either for food for donkey, for fences, jellies, beverages, clothes, uh, different types of salads. There's a whole variety of species. Mexico has maybe 600 uh, different species of cactus. And this is all contrasted to, you know, Mexico, according to Schultes in his classic, is the is the country in the world with the largest psychedelic or uh, uh, flora and fauna in the planet. There's a huge 
diverse amount of substances. And there is almost zero visibility to this kind of, uh, you know, tradition and history. So Mexican is basically indigenous, and indigenous groups had a very rich psychoactive life. So Mexico is literally bo uh, built and raised on top of psychoactives. And there is like no institutional support, official recognition. You know, I, I think there should be, uh, actually there is a cactus day, but there should be, uh, uh, you know, multiple forms of interest and, and attention and funding to these topics. And there is practically none. Uh, it's a very strong contrast between the lack of um, research and visibility and pride with the reality of Mexico. So I, I wanted to make my little contribution in this, in this regard. And what we try to do with this book is that, uh, I'm not going to say I read all the literature because that would be a tremendous lie, but I definitely mapped everything that had been written ever about peyote. Like we have this like, you know, well, researchers kind of things that you, you, you map out. So we divided by all the areas like biomedical, uh, social sciences, law, um, natural, natural sciences like botany and ecology, and saw the main areas that had been covered and what were the main topics of debate. And realized two things. A lot of the people that did those works were dead. A lot of classics then are like editions that are gone. And uh, there was very little that was an overview from a larger perspective that talked about the phenomenon in general, which is, was not just an ethnography of one specific use or one d discussion on legal aspects. Not saying that those approaches are not uh, interesting or useful, they are completely. But what we wanted to do with this book was to, to give this larger panorama that was saying peyote is not just related to indigenous people, it has a large history with mestizo people, it has a large history in, uh, with a popular pharmacopoeia. So this book aims uh, you know, to, to bring together the, f the, the, the fields as a whole. And so the book is mainly interdisciplinary. The book is a cross, crossroads between anthropology, law, and conservation or biology. Or anthropology, I shouldn't be saying that with the presence of two distinguished historians. Let's say social sciences and history uh, on the one side, and uh, the other areas, as I said. It also has the merits of bringing together uh, discussions. Uh, Alec, interestingly, didn't mention Canada on his little introduction, so it's not just Mexico and US. It also talks about Canada. That's the chapter of Erica, and you know the most recent uh, uh, versions of the Native American church that were uh, created in Canada. And the book aims to give voice to, to multiple actors, so we had Portuguese-speaking um, uh, authors, we had Spanish-speaking authors, and we had uh, North American authors. Of course, that's also a challenge. It's very hard to publish for non-native speakers like myself to publish in English. Everything I write, somebody has to read and correct. Uh, APA doesn't accept titles in other languages, so you have to translate all the titles of all the references. These are very little details that we, we took, you know, we put a lot of, of care and passion into this project. So everything is extremely taken care of. We had multiple versions of the chapters. Every chapter has pictures, because we know people like to look pictures. There's charts, there's tables, there's st statistics. So as we say in Portuguese, caprichado, it's taken care of. It's done with a lot of, um, you know, care. And we also have the voice of a Native American um, author that uh, is one of the chapters that is also a sensitive issue, like questions of representation and who has the right to speak about who. So that's a general overview on how the, how the book came about, what it is about. Now I'm just going to throw there like two books, which I hope we can talk more in the debate. Uh, about content and um, this, this, this two, these two uh, elements, I, I consider that are, let's say, perhaps some of the main challenges or paradoxes of the, you know, discussion about peyote and the matters of regulation. 
So I could go multiple directions. I'm going to talk about regulation because I think this is something that weaves everything together, all different areas, and uh, you know, peyote with other substances. Uh, there is this expression that I like very much that it doesn't translate into Portuguese or Spanish, which is a catch-22. Maybe the historians know the <laughs> how this expression came about. To me, it's just a very funny expression. Uh, there's lots of catches 22 in the case of peyote. What are the catches 22? What, one is the very, I don't think this is particular to peyote. This is relative to psychedelics in general. Uh, also have met Gillian today and we were talking about, you know, this bridges between psychedelics and drug policy world. So he's, this has to do with this. One, one paradox is that the definition of these substances are as Schedule One substances are substances that have no medical potentials and potentials of abuse. So the very definition of what peyote is excludes a central, you know, uh, identity or characteristic of what peyote is for the people uh, who, who, who have traditionally consumed peyote. And traditionally here I want to be, you know, generous in my definition of tradition. Why is that a paradox? Because if you want to uh, take these substances out of this list, you would have to prove that they are not, they don't have high power of abuse and they have, do have medical potentials. Well, guess what? It's very hard to, to do <laughs> this kind of research if the substance is forbidden. So it's a kind of, you know, circular, circuitous, schizophrenic situation where you can't really take the substances out of this list because of the definitions they have. You can, but it's rather complex and expensive and bureaucratic. There's some research, but still little, much less with peyote, uh, I would say. And then, uh, you know, related to this, it's another paradox that in, we have a book that I also want to recommend. It's called uh, religious freedom, human rights, and prohibition regulating traditional drug use. And modestly, it's very cool as well. I don't want to say one book is more cool than others because they are like my child's. I like all of them. They are all important to me. But this book, we're talking about how substances that were used traditionally migrated to our menus and how they were incorporated and regulated for us. Uh, so in, in Amanda Fieldling talks about in her chapter the paradox of psychedelics, which they are not an, enough of a social problem to raise too much questioning. Like it's not of enough uh, big deal in you know, mainstream society to, so people can bother discussing them. It's different than, for example, substances like heroin or cocaine or marijuana, which are widely used. So the fact that they are used by minorities place them in some kind of weird, exotic, folkloric, curious you know, spot that is hard that you have a discussion to reschedule psychedelics. Uh, it's harder than other substances that are more widely used and are more related to violence and to uh, drug, drug problem use and to treatment and to trafficking and to you know, underground economies and all this violence and all, all this kind of thing. So that's one set of paradoxes um, that exist regarding psychedelics in general. Peyote is just one among other psychedelics. Another set of paradoxes, which I consider more specific to the case of peyote, uh, have to do with what I'm going to call here, to make it simplistic, the needs of the man versus the needs of the species. What am I going to say about that? Let's, to the like Pachamama lovers, the, the, you know, <laughs> the, the hippies, the new age, the people that maybe are in this audience and people like me and all of you, like there's an interest on this substance and this can be considered sacramental and uh, spiritual and therapeutic, existential and uh, uh, related to multiple dimensions of life. Perhaps from a more strictly point of view, we are actually predators to the species and man is the main predator of peyote. Peyote is this cactus, that is fragile cactus, this rare cactus, this, uh, you know, plant that takes maybe 10 years to de fully develop, or maybe in other versions, 30 years. So what some people consider like the communion with this plant spirit, in fact, is an attack to the plant as a species. So man is, is one of the main, it's the main predator, 
of peyote. Peyote is, has a very bitter taste. The defense of peyote is being bitter. That's his protection. So there's a, almost no predators to peyote because of that characteristic, except human beings, which still think that peyote is bitter, but like the benefits of peyote anyway. So like from a more strictly environmental perspective, what we do is decapitate a, cap a cactus to consume it. So what is happening, there's a growth of mouths interested in eating peyote. And the wild populations, they don't grow as much. They don't grow as fast. They are not so able to regenerate. So when you had just you know, smaller traditional societies eating peyote, that was more balanced situation between the amount of peyote that is alive and the amount of peyote that people use. But nowadays, this balance is disrupted. Uh, this is not just due to human condition, human pred pred predators. That uh, you know, there's ways that the cactus get much more damaged, like uh, soil uh, development, like plotting and um, um, cattle agriculture. Just like as ayahuasca, you know, you can have a bunch of hippies going to the Amazon, but in five minutes, just a huge amount of the forest gets deforestated, and with that, a lot of of vine together. So I'm not just saying that it's just man, there's other man activities that influence peyote, but the fact is that there is this tension and peyote is considered, there's like two different classifications of peyote danger. One is the international agreements and the other is the Mexican legislation. They have different ways of classifi classifying like vulnerable, extinct, uh, endangered, so there is like this continuum. In, in the Mexican legislation, it's forbidden in one level and in the international on another one. In both, it's considered endangered, uh, fragile. So what is the problem there? The problem, what is the catch-22? It's a plant that it takes a long time to grow. It's fragile, it's rare, it's endogenous to just uh, uh, northern Mexico and southern Texas in the world. And you cannot plant, you cannot cultivate. So that's a huge paradox, because how are you going to keep up with the people uh, eating peyote if you can't cultivate peyote? It's, it's a total schizophrenic situation where one could even wonder if, you know, legislatures are in fact trying to extinct the cultural practices through these laws, because if you can't create, uh, you know, species. So that's another dimension of the drug war, which is the drug war is uh, anthropocentric, anthropocentric war. It's where the human beings considered to be superior and have the right to ex extinguish certain species, like what we do with, we try to do with uh, coca leaf and just, you know, uh, attacking plantations and trying to destroy a plant. Peyote is in a fragile situation and then I'm gonna, you know, go towards wrapping up. Why is this such a challenge and where does it all come together? Law, anthropology, conservation, because if it's a, a scarce resource, how do you regulate who has access to it? The, the, the current ideology is, well, if, if you have, if it's fragile and there's not enough, you should have, give priority to indigenous people who are the historical holders or uh, uh, original users. This opens up a door to a huge discussion. What is indigenous? How do you define indigenous? Where do you draw the lines? What, what do you do with the non-indigenous use of peyote? Like in a country like Mexico, for example, that it has been used in multiple ways uh, since ever, or in the US where you have, you know, certain tribes never did treaties with the government, so they're not federally recognized as tribes, but they are recognized uh, by their state law. So you have this whole discussion, and, and, and here the problem of authentic Authenticity doesn't become just a theoretical problem of who is more authentic and who is doing the right ritual and who is, uh, you know, holding which lineage, but it's a matter of human rights. Because if you're not considered authentic or traditional or legitimate, then you're uh, subject to criminal persecution. And so I consider, you know, that's another uh, great paradox of. Um, of, of peyote uh, regulation and of ecology. Again, a sub-paradox or whole family of discussions within this general field is, is different views of what the species is and different policies about cultivation. 
because it's said that some traditional people are against cultivation. For example, like there's reports coming from the Native American church that they will say things like the great spirit didn't plant peyote. Peyote was, um, you know, it was there. It's not up to us to plant it or just like a biologist interviewing an Indian and the Indian will say, well, you think peyote is disappearing because you're white and you go out in the desert and peyote hides itself from you. But for us that we're Indians, we can see it. Uh, or just other situations like the witch all people in Mexico, they do a ritual pilgrimage to go catch peyote, hunt peyote. Peyote is the deer that you hunt. So it wouldn't make a lot of sense to cultivate for these populations. Whereas maybe some more new age friendly people are more into cultivation. Uh, and so that's a paradox that you would have to think of a legislation. Regulating peyote is much more challenging than other substances because there is the problem of ecology. And if you just regulate it and it doesn't go hand in hand with a very clear sustainable management plan, it's suicide. So it's not about whether you're Indian or not, but it's about our responsibility towards the species. So the, the, the book talks a little bit about this, about the multiple actors that are interested uh, uh, in all of this substance, a substance that according to uh, Alec Dawson, who's doing a great book uh, on the history of peyote, and I'm just gonna you know, finish by quoting him uh, and you know, his fascinating discussion on the, the discussions of the colonizers, um, uh, when they, they got to the, to the new world and they were discussing when, uh, uh, the nature of peyote and some, you know, some religious missionaries were claiming that peyote itself was the devil. While others claimed that peyote was the evidence that the devil had been in the old world. <laughs> so that was the, the result of the, the passage of the devil. So this substance has, you know, uh, deep roots in our imagination have to do a lot with two major areas of taboo. One is the idea of drug, of hallucination, of danger, of madness, of um, uh, poison, of pathology. And the other has to do with the idea of indigenity, with race, with class, colo classical colonial definitions and classical uh, you know, relationships to the other, to alterity, to what is different than us. Either different in terms of cognition, other spaces and times, or different in terms of ethnicity of uh, our relationship to the others. This book wants to shed light into these complex discussions and you know, give another perspective on this very little, powerful, charismatic cactus. Thank you. Thank you, Bia. You know, what you're saying reminds me of the fact that um, peyote was actually the first drug outlawed in the Americas. Uh, the, first, the first laws against peyote were passed by the Spanish Inquisition in 1620. And it has, since 1620, pretty much been uh, in and out of legal consciousness as something that has been thought to be dangerous or threatening or or diabolic, or, or, any, or sort of embodied any number of threats that, uh, that carry through to this today as something that is dangerous. And what has always been sort of remarkable about it is that alongside those who have always said it's dangerous, it's diabolic, it's, it's, it's a threat to civilization, it's, it's a threat to purity, have been this, uh, this, this, uh, this other countervailing voice of people who have said it's harmless, it's, 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 it's healthful, it is it is something that is part of, that it heals. And that, that tension over whether it is something dangerous that will destroy us and make us impure or make us mad, and whether it is something that, that, that will cure us, right? Um, in, in some sense, in, 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 the, in the colonial lexicon, it's, it's, a, it's a purgative. It means it makes you throw up, right? And people, even, even non-indigenous peoples in the colonial period would take it so that they would throw up if they felt that they had been poisoned. They would also take it, they would take it for what they called, you know, pains in the head, right? Things, things that we think of in a contemporary way uh, of, of mental health issues, right? And yet there's, al and there's always been this, this, this stream of people who've, who've, who've seen peyote as this really, really powerful medicine, who've been counterposed against these people, who've seen it as this very dangerous thing. And that, that opposition is not something that seems to change over time. 
It seems to just always be there in, in, any, in every successive generation, in, in, in a different iteration, but always the same argument about something that is very, very dangerous and something that is very, very curative. Our next speaker uh, is Professor Erica Dick, who's a, a Canada Research Chair at the University of Saskatchewan and uh, has published extensively about psychedelics um, on the prairies. Um. Thank you very much, Alec. Okay. It's not on? It's on? Oh. Um, I had made a PowerPoint for keeping myself on track. So, click open. There we go. Whoops. And now I don't know how to go back. All right. Um, well, first of all, I really want to thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, I'm really pleased to be part of this. And I, I just wanted to say a little bit about how I became involved in this project. Um, Bia contacted me and asked me if I would write something about peyote in Canada. And I said, nope, um, there isn't anything to say about peyote in Canada. And she said, oh, no, no, come on, you can do that. And uh, I had written like a few little bits about a peyote ceremony in a book about LSD experiments in Saskatchewan. And I really didn't feel that there was enough that I could you know, um, elaborate into a full chapter on this. But, but she encouraged me to go back to the archives and do a little bit more digging and continue reading through the secondary literature to find traces of peyote's existence in Canada, not, not its ecological existence in Canada, but its use primarily by the Native American church, but also the way in which the government was reacting to um, to the use. So I tried to cobble together a chapter and I felt like that was probably all of it. Um, what happened is I went back to the archives in Saskatchewan where there was a psychologist, or sorry, a psychiatrist named Abram Hoffer who um, some of you may know. Abram Hoffer worked with Humphrey Osmond who eventually coined the word psychedelic and uh, were very involved in LSD treatments in the Weyburn Hospital but also throughout Saskatchewan and this uh, went around uh, quite internationally and um, they became quite famous for working on LSD treatments for alcoholism but also LSD as a model psychosis for insights into madness and they were very much involved in mental health reform forms throughout Saskatchewan and then ultimately in New York um, and elsewhere actually really throughout the world. So they started working on those projects in 1951. Abram Hoffer's sister, who I'm going to talk about in a moment, um, wrote a book about peyote use in the 1960s and that manuscript was never published um, but it was it was, con it was contained in Abram Hoffer's paper. So I came across this manuscript and I thought, oh, this is a wonderful resource for me to help write this chapter. And it was on Bia's suggestion that she said, what is this wonderful manuscript? I said, oh, it's, in the, it's in the archives. It was never published. She attempted to have it published several times and it was always turned down. The University of New Mexico Press turned it down and I, I only have correspondence that she tried to get it published in several Canadian uh, venues and no one published it. And Bia suggested, well, you should publish it now. <laughs> What? <laughs> I, you know, I went from two sentences on peyote to a chapter to a book. Um, so it's Bia's fault, and thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so what I, what I wanted to talk about for a few minutes today is the book that is, I was told is at the printers today. I've got some flyers at the back table. Uh, we really tried to have it available physically uh, today, but that was it was impossible to do. Um, so the book is, was originally written by Fanny Cahan, or really coordinated by Fanny Cahan, and she's pictured here working for the Winnipeg Free Press. Um, and... There she is, uh, married to her husband, Erwin Cahan. So if anyone is interested, Erwin Cahan, there's, there's an interesting story here with these families. First of all, they were uh, Jewish farmers, which uh, you don't hear very often. And there was a Jewish farming settlement in Saskatchewan, so they have a very interesting story. Um, but also, Erwin Cahan was the director of the Canadian Mental Health Association in Saskatchewan. She's also the, the sister of the leading psychiatrist in Saskatoon, who's the the last guy who illegally in Canada was able to get LSD, which he did for about 18 years. Um, so there's a really interesting family connection here who are profoundly interested in madness, mental health, mental health reform, and socialism and, and socialized Medicare, which was part of what they described as, you know, we need to find healing that is socially acceptable, uh, that is harm prevention, although they didn't quite use that language, but preventative, proactive, and one that fits within a state system. And so this is sort of the philosophy by which they started doing their work with mescaline, LSD, and a variety of other drugs, um, but they also became very interested in peyote. And partly that was because they were visited 
in 1956 by a Cree group outside of North Battleford in the Red Pheasant uh, Reserve, who came to these uh, psychiatrists and psychologists and social worker, and Fanny Cahan's a journalist, and asked them whether they could come and attend a peyote ceremony. They said, you are scientists who are studying this. How could you come and help us lobby the government for access to peyote? Tell them it's not harmful. Tell them it's not dangerous. See if I can remember what my pictures are. Um, oh yeah, this pic I told you the pictures were just here to remind me what to tell you. Um, so there's Fanny sitting with her husband, Erwin, and their children, Sharon, Meldon, and Barbara. Uh, the most important person who's given me access to all of this material and the photographs and who was very excited to see her. Her mother died in 1973, um, but they were, the family has been very supportive of having this project move forward, so I also want to thank them here publicly. Um, so what's interesting to me is this is the only book that Fanny wrote that was not published. And she's published several books. I've listed some of them here. Many of them she published with her brother, Abram Hoffer, the psychiatrist. Um, but others she wrote about her mother and father's journey from Israel to a place that doesn't exist anymore in Saskatchewan because it was a Jewish farming settlement. And within one generation, absolutely everyone left. Um, land of hope. <laughs> Funny story. Um, how to Live with Schizophrenia was uh, written with her brother. Uh, she actually wrote the book, but her brother uh, put his name on it, and they argued they, in the correspondence. They said this was because they wanted to actually get it published. Um, but Fanny, she also wrote children's stories. She wrote lots of things and got them published, but her peyote book was not ever, well, now it is published. OK, so I want to talk a little bit about the ceremony, because that's really what, this, what her book is about. I've merely provided an introduction, but what we've done is just cleaned it up a little bit, um, taken out some of the typos, added a few references, updated it a little bit um, so that today's readers can appreciate some of the things that have filled in. But there's something really interesting going on here. Not only were they invited to attend a peyote ceremony in October 1956, um, but they also were visited by anthropologists, American anthropologists, who had traveled throughout Mexico, and they came to talk to them about this. So there was something going on in Canada. It was just um, buried a little bit. OK, so I'll, I'll briefly tell you about the ceremony. It's October 1956. Uh, uh, the Native American church officials in Montana uh, came to Saskatchewan. They got together with Louis Sunchild, who was a medicine man, and the then leader of the Native American church in Canada. And they joined others in Saskatchewan and said, we're going to have a peyote ceremony, and we're going to start our own branch of the Native American Church in Canada. And they applied through this through the Benevolent Societies Act, and they were granted permission through the Saskatchewan government to set up the church. Um, but what happened was the federal government got a bit uncomfortable with this move. In 1951, the Canadian government had changed the Indian Act and suggested, or in, in that change in the act, they said, you know, we're Sorry about assimilation. Well, they didn't really say that. I'm paraphrasing. Um, I'm pretty sure they never said that. <laughs> but cultural activities are not only OK, but we encourage traditional cultural activities. So forget, sorry about the sun dance. Sorry about the potlatch. You, you can do what you want now. So they said, great. This is a wonderful opportunity for us to bring the Native American church into Canada. And we're going to include peyote use as part of that. And the federal bureaucrat said, well, no, that's not what really what we meant. <laughs> no. That's an imported thing. So here we come back to the ecological dimension. They said, well, the, the peyote cactus doesn't grow in Canada. Therefore, it's not an authentic indigenous expression in Canadian terms. We're all for multiculturalism and cultural sensitivity, but not you know, fake ones or imported ones or non-Canadian, never mind the authenticity of indigenous practices. And so what happened was this group got together in North Battleford. It was originally scheduled for earlier, but um, true story, they didn't, they didn't have enough extension cords to get out to there to record everything, so they changed the ceremony and moved it closer to a power outlet. Um, yeah, Canadian story, right? <laughs> um, and they got together and had this ceremony where the four, as you can see, white men uh, witnessed the peyote rituals. And they sent a photographer and a recorder out to this ceremony. And so these were the, the four white men, uh, were Abram Hoffer, Humphrey Osmond, Teddy Wekowitz, and Duncan Blewett. Um, these are the men who had coined the word psychedelic, wrote the first therapeutic handbook on the, on the therapeutic uses of LSD, wrote an abnormal psych textbook about the effects of LSD. So these were some of the key researchers in the area early on. 
these are some of the sketches that showed up in the, in the newspaper. And I'm grateful also to the Saskatoon Star Phoenix. The uh, new editor has given me full access to their collection of about 78 photographs from this particular weekend event. So here, I've just got a few pictures now to show you of the event. What happened was Humphrey Osmond, so um, the guy um, about to eat a button, uh, he fully uh, partook in the ceremony. The others were sort of scribes and they took notes. Um, and then each of them wrote about their experiences witnessing and participating in the, in the uh, ceremony itself. And that really forms the, f the foundation of the book that Fanny Cahan then assembled. These men wrote some of the chapters, but she edited them and put them all together. Um, here's a few. A few minutes later. Sorry? Yes, Osmond is doing this. <laughs> Um, he's a very erudite Londoner uh, who would stick out a lot on the Canadian prairies, but uh, he, he tried to fit in. Um, the fellow on this side is Duncan Blewett, so he was the first sort of the founding director of the Department of Psychology at University of Regina. And I was giving a talk last night in, in Victoria, and there were three people who came, two of whom, one was hired by Duncan Blewett and one who was a student of Duncan Blewett, so I asked them publicly um, whether it was true that Duncan Blewett told his students ahead of time that his classes, his lectures would be more understandable if they dropped acid an hour or two before coming to class. <laughs> she said yes. <laughs> um, so there's this wonderful series of photographs, and what we're trying to do with the, with the publisher is have an online component where we feature more and more of the photographs. Of course, they don't want to print them all, um, but there will be will be more. In, the, in any of the correspondence, in the Star Phoenix records, in the letters that go back and forth between the, the white men, uh, the, none of these people are named. So it's been a real challenge, a sort of ethical dimension as to whether or not we show these photographs and we don't necessarily have permission and nor did they have permission at the time. So there's Abram Hoffer. So that's Fanny Cahan's brother. Um, they all have really wonderful socks, too. But it's really interesting. I mean, you could do a whole uh, study of, of the images here. They're very much dressed up. This is a very, and um, one of the things that they wrote about subsequently was how important this ritual was, how important ritual was for the way that the peyote was being taken, but also how seriously this event was being scrutinized. And so what comes of it is these, folks write, the guys, uh, write up these stories or write up their impressions and they use this to then work with uh, uh, legal uh, scholars and lawyers to lobby the federal government to accept peyote use for the Native American church and open a branch in Canada. Um, and they, they take it, you know, several, level, several levels and it persists for about a decade but ultimately the Food and Drug Administration, of course, comes in and says it doesn't grow in Canada. Um, that's just about it. Yeah. Um, so that's the book. It's Fanny Cahan's book, um, you know, several many years after she, uh, after she wrote it. So if you're interested, there's copies of the, how you can order it in the, in the back. But thank you to Bia for encouraging me to do this in the first place. <laughs> thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Gabor Mate, who I believe was at SFU until very recently, uh, there was a slight mix-up as to where we were going to be, has made his way all the way out to, to UBC, so we're going we're gonna to proceed with his comments next. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, can you hear me at the back? So, it seems I got here just in time. Um, Wade Davis, who is not here, is that right? Um, in his um, Massey lectures, uh, published as the uh, Wayfarer, um, talked about the disappearance of languages, and uh, it's. And Robert Bringhurst has also talked about that, just how rapidly um, every year we're losing dozens of languages, and some languages. Can you imagine being the last person in your lineage to speak your language? And we may think, so what? I mean, why can't we just all speak English or Chinese or some universal language? But of course, when it comes to languages, it's not just a matter of, 
a word, precisely translating another word. I keep hearing, I don't know if it's true or not, but the famous trope about the Inuit having, I don't know how many dozens of words for the, for the word snow. It's clear that when an Inuit, if that's true, and I have to assume that there's some truth to it, if that is true, then when an Inuit thinks of snow, they have a very different conception of it than I do. And simply to translate their 38 or 40 nuanced understanding of the phenomena that we call snow as that one word, well, something must be lost in translation. And in the same way, languages carry not just the meanings of words and specific uh, objects or concepts, but they carry with them an entire way of looking at life and a mythology uh, and an explanation of existence and of the human dilemma and some, whatever the human dilemma is, and some solutions to that human dilemma. And therefore, for me, as a Western-trained Western -trained physician, to talk about the meaning uh, or the um, use of plants that were pioneered and developed in cultures that are totally foreign to me uh, would be presumptuous. Because what I mean by things is not at all necessarily what they, those who develop to work with these plants, what they mean by it, and what they see by it, and what they understand by it. Jeremy Narby, uh, who is an anthropologist, I think, and he, he wrote this wonderful book called The Cosmic Serpent about his investigations into the ayahuasca phenomena, says somewhere that Western scientists and researchers are very prone to investigate or even make use of the findings of Aboriginal peoples, but without for a moment taking seriously or respecting the explanations that those people give why those substances work. In which there's more than a little bit of, um, if not arrogance, then ignorance of, uh, of possibilities other than our own mind allows for. So therefore, when I speak about these plants, I'm speaking from a very limited perspective, and that of, a, again, a Western-trained um, physician come therapist. I am not familiar with peyote. The closest I've come to it really, well, uh, maybe mescaline. I'm not sure how the two compare, but I never know how to compare plants. Most people ask me, well, what's the difference between ayahuasca and mushrooms? Or ayahuasca and, you know, say a man-made product like LSD. I can never explain the differences, but I know that they exist. But, the, but there was a very well-known anthropologist who came from the States to SFU, actually, in the 60s, Richard Aberley. Does the name mean anything to anybody here, Aberley? Well, he actually did the work with the, uh, the uh, native tribes in the States because at some point, they wanted to ban peyote as an addictive, harmful substance. And of course, there was addiction around it. People were using it that way. But he did the research, he went to the native communities, he listened to their stories, um, transcribed their myths. I say myths, I don't mean anything pejorative by it, but I mean their foundational stories about the world. And he concluded uh, in his very well-known report that actually peyote is a real uh, conduit, uh, a legitimate religious uh, spiritual pathway for a lot of people and cannot be dismissed as just another addictive drug that people will misuse. And his report was very influential in getting the U.S. Congress, therefore, to whatever legislation was passed that did allow for the continuation of peyote uh, usage for spiritual purposes in the States. And, and when Richard died, um, and I believe that was his first name, uh, quite some years ago now, people came from far away in the States, native people came to honor his memory for what he had done for them. 
But again, the whole situation that a, a Caucasian uh, academic has to do research to validate the ages old sal sal salutary, healthful, and spiritually enhancing practices of native people is again just a sign of our arrogance. So really, that's I've just exhausted everything I know about peyote. Uh, so I'm not here to talk to you about peyote. I wasn't asked to actually. I was asked to talk about my view of the use of these plants in, in healing and therapeutic ways. So what I'm giving you, therefore, is a Western-based perspective that says nothing about the spiritual dimensions of these plants which I have scarcely experienced, although I've witnessed people experiencing them. But let me tell you an interesting story. So, I work with ayahuasca, as many of you know, and um, there was a person we worked with who you, you can certainly diagnose with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. This person dissociates when this, when I'm trying to use gender-free language here, so I'm going to use the word they, okay? This person dissociates when they feel challenged in any way at all. Uh, you can look at their face and you see absence. Or you see for a minute for, for, uh, transforming from an adult into a scared little child. And you can certainly say that this person is possessed because at the moments when that takes over who they are doesn't exist anymore and what we're seeing is a possession now in my western terms I can interpret that as uh, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, as dissociation. And on the neurobiological level, I, c I can explain it by saying that in certain states of fear, different parts of the nervous system take over, and the adult, more later developed uh, brain circuits that mod moderate and modulate adult functioning simply are not available to them. And what's taken over are nerve circuits that are deeply embedded and originate in the reptilian hindbrain, full of fear, full of freeze, and absolutely not present to the moment. And I'm quite satisfied with that explanation. The Iowa scarers I work with, when they see this person, they talk about a full possession in a sense of entities who have entered her. I just gave away the gender. Okay. <laughs> so much for gender neutrality. Uh, who have entered this person and who have taken over and are actually controlling their behavior. And I don't mind that. I don't mind that difference. They can think of it that way if they want to. And I can think of it in my own way. That makes sense to me. But the Ayahuascaros, they see devils with her. They do. And these devils actually will come out of her and sometimes attack the Ayahuascaros. Now, you know, I'm sitting there in the same dark room as they are. I'm not seeing devils. I'm just seeing people sitting there. The funny thing is, is that this person sent me an email once with a drawing. And this person is convinced that she is evil uh, in moments of despair on um, deserving of support that she deserves to suffer and as compassionate as she can be with others and she is she's completely incapable of compassion for herself so she sent me an email once with a drawing <laughs> that she, she did to describe what it's like for her when she's in a state like that. And there's this little girl, 
And there's this devil with a tail and horns saying, you're evil. Now, I'm not too sure what to make of the story. I'm not sure what to make of the story, except that perhaps there's something to that devil that my always care about. He's seeing her. Which me, in my, with my Western psychological training and insight and, 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 and neurophysiological understanding, you know, I, I, I ascribe to trauma, traumatic experiences, implicit memories, and disturbed brain functioning. At the very least, we have to recognize that there are different ways of describing phenomena. And to all practical purposes, she may as well be possessed, because that's what I see. She is possessed at that such moment. I don't have to believe in the entity that my buddies see. But do I really know? So from the Western point of view, and let's not forget that I'm not sure what kind of psychological problems native people had in North America prior to the conquest. And I'm not sure that uh, mental illness was an issue in the way it is right now for a lot of us. I just don't have any history of that, uh, historical awareness of that. And although the shamans, the medicine people, the medicine men, medicine women, would certainly be healing people. I know there's much more to their work than simply the healing of what we call disease. That their work also had to do with spiritual quests and, and, and connections with higher levels of consciousness and, and uh, plants and animals and all that. So I'm not trying to reduce, and you cannot reduce what they did and what they do to Western psychological terms. But on those terms, on that narrow field of Western psychology, neurophysiology, uh, what's clear to me is that the plants have the capacity in the right context with the right guidance to tap deeply into not just the unconscious of the individual, not just the fear and the pain and the anger and the beauty and the truth. Not just the isolation, but also the unity in any one individual. But also what uh, Jung might have called the uh, collective um, unconscious. Where there's archetypical states, and you might even say entities and that the plant experience has the power to illuminate and, and make visible for people these archetypical uh, images, which all speak, of course, to the uh, human psyche and what we all unconsciously carry. Now, in, um, in his book, and, and, and of course, bringing it to the surface, bringing it to vision is the whole point. I mean psychotherapists spend decades, you know, <laughs> you know, psychoanalysis spends decades trying to elicit the expression of the unconscious so that the psychiatrist or the psychoanalyst can then interpret it or help the person interpret it for themselves. And it's a very slow process, by the way, when you do it that way. And there's a funny cartoon in The New Yorker uh, a couple of years ago, Popeye the sailor is lying on this psychiatric couch, or this psychoanalyst couch, you know, and the psychoanalyst with typical Viennese beard and, you know, Freudian beard and mustache and, and glasses, and sitting there taking notes copiously as, the, as Popeye lying on this couch, you know, with his big spinach arms and all the tattoos and his pipe in his mouth and his little sailor cap. And Popeye's saying, I am what I am. But how do I know what I am? Uh, what if I am not what I am? 
how can we know any of us know what we am? You know, and the and the caption says, eight hundred seventy-five thousand dollars later. You know, <laughs> so it, it's a, it's a rather slow process sometimes. And as any of you have worked with the plants, you know that you get their zap like that in one night sometimes. And uh, certainly um, over several experiences, you can be guided much more deeply than you might have gone by almost any other route. Which doesn't mean that the journey's over, because it has to be integrated, which is very difficult. But nevertheless, you get to places that you just, most people, most people can never get to, or don't have the resources or the time, nor do they have the expert help to get there. So from my point of view, that's what happens, is that the, uh, the plant experience removes the egoic, in control, deluded mind from the picture and then whatever is really underneath can emerge and what can and what can emerge is both the terror and the beauty because they're both there and which experience you're going to have is not predictable i don't think so these plants were not developed for the uh, neurotic and this is not a pejorative, I'm talking descriptively, for a neurotic society. They were developed in cultures that had cohesion, that had a common cultural language, that had a shared mythology, a shared uh, set of symbols, and which physically functioned as a unit. So they were not developed for our society. So that then to use them the way we do, when I say we, I mean those of us that work with it in a therapeutic sense, is an adaptation. Um, it's an adaptation which is a tribute to the power of the plants and the power of the wisdom that developed the work with the plants over the centuries. And really is a matter of uh, the unconscious, the unconscious carries memories from in utero, memories that are not accessible to the conscious mind, maybe not even accessible to language, but from in utero onwards. And of course, as some people will have it, I've never s experienced it, nor do I credit it because my mind doesn't go there, but who's to say? Sometimes. They bring up experiences for previous generations. <laughs> My own point of view is, that's okay, I got enough trouble with this one. I don't have to, I don't have to go back to a thousand years, you know, or three thousand years. But some people do. And I just have to say, I don't know what to make of that. But I do know that, even from my point of view, which is again a very limited one, the capacity to reveal what is hidden from us and what is hidden, of course, can be seen in two ways. I've alluded to them. Uh, what is hidden can be seen as all the repressed, dark material that we just don't know how to face in our lives, that we had to repress because the pain was too much and there wasn't the support for us to bear it, so we should repress it. That's straightforward. But that's not the only thing that's available. That's not the only thing we don't see. What we also don't see is what people will often tell you after such experiences, and also, of course, after spiritual experiences of any sort, with or without plants. What they will tell you is the unity, the oneness, the connection, the illusion of separation, the illusion of the isolated self, the illusion even of form, and I can intellectually not only understand all that, I can actually agree with it. I mean, when you think about it, we take ourselves so seriously, but let's face it, we're a rather random collection of molecules that came together because two other molecules came together sometime, some decades ago, had another, had another other bunch of molecules got together, we would even exist. 
and yet every particle of us would exist. Uh, that's just straightforward scientific logic. But, but of course, people with the help or the leadership or the guidance of these plants and the entities that the plants evoke have these experiences of unity. I can't say that I have. So I'm, I'm talking rather intellectually with a kind of intuitive awareness, but not from direct experience. But people have those experiences. So the plants can reveal what's hidden, both in terms of the dark material, but also in terms of the light that otherwise we often don't see. Most of us don't. Some people do. So to conclude then, um, if that's all they did, I'd say that's enough for me. And that's why I horrified Bia last time she was up here, because I said, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not that interested in research, you know, and she's a researcher, so, you know, I've just invalidated her whole career. But what I was saying by that is personally I'm not interested, not so much that I'm not interested, but I don't need it to validate for me the use of these substances. What I've seen is already enough. If I've only seen what I've seen, if I've never seen any, never heard of anybody else's experiences, if I've never read Bio's publications, if I never um, uh, talked with anybody else, if I just seen what I've witnessed with my own eyes, that would be sufficient for me, and I don't need a research paper to validate my own experience. Having said that, of course, there's great value in research, because we don't live in a world that validates direct experience. In fact. It invalidates direct experience. Uh, when people have direct experiences, uh, if they simply describe their experiences, they would classify for, for a number of psychiatric diagnoses. So the research is needed uh, for two reasons. One is to validate in a mind-based world what the Aboriginal peoples have always known. Number one and number two, certainly research is useful to find what are the best ways of working with these substances. So when I say that I don't need the research, I don't mean that <laughs> categorically. I simply mean that without knowing anything about shamans, without knowing anything about you know tradition, uh, just what I've witnessed of the power of the plants to take people into states of transformation in a way that informed their lives from then on. So it wasn't just a one-off experience. Th that for me would be sufficient um, proof of the power, which again is a tribute to the incredible wisdom and, and, and something more than that of these ancients who, how do they find out how to work with these plants and how to mix them up together and how much to use and for how long and all this, you know? Well, they tell me, and then of course they tell Jeremy Narby, is that we listen to the plants. Well, think about that. To go back to my earlier comments about language. I imagine having a language that allows you to listen to plants. So I, I do approach this with a lot of respect and a lot of reverence and um, a lot of ignorance. And again, what I know of it is, I'm sure, just a small sliver of the overall reality of it. All right, thank you. Our final speaker tonight is going to be Alan Spiro, who's a professor at the University of Texas. And she's going to be showing a, sh are you going to show the film at the beginning? Um, she's going to be showing a short. There is, there is no beginning or end, it's the middle. She's, she's, she, or better, we're going to show it right now. So um, if the, if the, this is, this film is, I believe that it's filled with all sorts well, of pornography and, and illicit, <laughs> uh, the, it, there's all sorts porn. of illegal behavior being filmed. <laughs> Not. So we're going to kill the webcast during the, during the period while the film is showing, and then we, we can come back to the webcast. The, the reason we're killing the webcast is because it's, it's just the beginning of a film. It's actually um, a, a combination of a, of, a, of a trailer and a work sample for a film that I'm making with uh, Bia. 
who is also, who, she, she's in it, she's sort of our guide, and I've been making films for several decades and pretty much follow my heart and my intuition about what I want to know about in the world and what I want to experience. And I'm a latecomer to the world of sacred plants and a newbie in all this. So making this film is my way of exploring it. And I feel very, very fortunate to have connected with Bia and have her let me um, travel with her with my camera. So what you're going to see is just shot, sound, everything I've just done myself, which is kind of how I started in the field of documentary filmmaking. I got into bigger productions and then kind of did a lot of soul searching about what I wanted to do now. So I'm kind of going back to this very small scale production. And I'd love your feedback after we show this seven minutes of a little bit of an adventure. It, it started out to be just about peyote and then I realized the connection between all these plants and the overlap. And I started um, experiencing ceremonies, um, uh, several ayahuasca ceremonies. And then there's uh, the mushroom ceremony that I experienced in Mexico with Bia is, is actually in the clips that you're going to see. And, and I was thinking a lot about plants in, in these ceremonies. And funny enough, I, in the ayahuasca ceremonies, was having visions of peyote. <laughs> and in the mushroom ceremony, I was having visions of ayahuasca. So he hence this idea of a sacred plant chronicles. Um, and that's also a working title until we come up with something better. Now, let's find out if there's any wisdom in this technology and if we can get it to work. I'm wondering what might have been your <laughs> what might have been sort of your strategy when you're making the video because when you do want to sort of share this message or just offer the knowledge to people there's definitely the aspect of well how can I present it in a way that isn't overly mystical but doesn't undervalue its potential so you know to almost reduce its ridicule so that it can just be you know really to not even put a, a kind of connotation on it just to have it exist as like this is what it is right so I'm wondering um, at least for me I had a very very arrogant attitude towards it, very restrictive, very closed-minded, very like people who do drugs, very, you know, they're not going to succeed in life, they're just, you know, bad, very narrow, myopic view of it, right? And so I always sort of check in with that kind of perspective to see how I might have approached someone like, who, like me in the past. Because, you know, certainly when we're discussing these things, we don't really do it for people who are already on board. Right, in, in a sense. So I, I don't know. Just kind of, kind of wondering what might. Anyway. You said a lot of good things and had had a lot of good questions. But uh, no, this might be a good time um, because that question was for you. But but I think that question actually addresses everyone. So maybe maybe the 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 people who presented can all come up and sit in the front, and I can, they can uh, discuss this question and other other questions, and I'll I'll wander around with the microphone. Um, that is on now. That is on now. So please. Come on, have a seat. Um, and if, uh, um, if, if you have a question, uh, just please put up your hand and I'll try and make my way to you uh, with the microphone. Okay, I'll come around. But go ahead and answer the question. There were so many questions there that these three are all more qualified to answer. I can talk about the strategy of the film. Um, I tried to actually liberate myself from a strategy on this film and, you know, um, let it evolve. And that's what's what's happening. So, it started as a film. Now I'm looking at it as a, as possibly a web series, you know, of smaller parts, chronicles for each of the plants. And the one that wasn't mentioned that I find fascinating that I've just been introduced to is a, a boga, um, and it's a tree. So we have a cactus, a vine, a tree, a mushroom. How cool is that? So, Bia, that's your star turn, though, right? That's your star turn. I, I do want to say one more thing, though, about your... You, you said so many good things in your questions, but there's this term that we've been joking about, psychedelic porn, um, which, you know, is these films that are out there all over YouTube of people 
you know, oh, these amazing these experiences, these experiences, and they're fascinating and they're riveting, but they're just one small part of the picture. So we, we're, we're treading that line, you know, by showing the ceremonies. How can you do a film about this without the ceremonies? But then how do we depict the experience? Well, I don't know if you noticed, but that's where this ends. We haven't answered that question yet, but we're not going to hire a 3D graphics company to do big hallucinogenic effects. You know, one of the very first psychedelic porn films was made of a British member of parliament in 1954. I'm trying to remember the name of the... A, a British member of parliament in 1954 who took a, a significant dose of mescaline while he had his mescaline experience. Over, it, was very, it was very subdued. Thank you for your lovely presentations. I very much enjoyed it. I'm interested in the ethical... Um, issues around the use of these plant medicines, and I'm particularly interested in cultural appropriation. Um, you know, you speak about all these plants, they belong to certain cultures, peoples, who have an extensive cosmovision that goes along with the use of these plants. And what I see is Western culture appropriating just pieces of these culture that suits our purposes you know, these mystical experiences, healing experiences, but not within the context of that larger cosmovision of that culture who uses those and who spent, you know, thousands of years developing these technologies. And so I'm curious to hear your comments um, about this and what you feel about this. Um, I, I particularly as an anthropologist, I am a little bit uh, wary and critical to the idea of authenticity and essentialization like this is much uh, uh, identity of politics politics identity is people the people who are practitioners they have these claims of tradition and authenticity and sort of uh, you know represent themselves as the original and the holders when we stole we we study these things uh, academically and historically scientifically we see that uh, the transformation, evolution, transmutation, reinvention, reappropriation is present through history in all diver diverse forms. Like you can't, what is a, a kind of common sense narrative about ayahuasca is that the Indians were using, dipping the forest, then the mestizo people started using, then the white people created the church, then the new age movement appropriated that, and then you have the kind of post new age contemporary use. But if you look historically, this purity doesn't exist. Ayahuasca has been, in many cases, started to be used in the contact, in the contact of indigenous peoples with outsiders, with foreigners, with white people, in the context of colonization. So a lot of what we think are traditional uses of ayahuasca were actually hybrid forms that emerged on riverine cities uh, you know, where like mestizo population got in contact with Christian missionaries and started practices of healing and these practices were imported back into the forest and indigenous people uh, started using these practices that they learned in urban areas and when we look at contemporary indigenous uses we think that they are the original users that taught the mestizo people but if, in fact if you look at that it was the other way around so there's multiple examples of that the example of the Native American Church of Canada is a good example of hybridization and you know, the Native American church, which claims this original use of peyote, actually they learned peyote from the northern tribes of Mexico, and they syncretized it with uh, Christianity in the context of reserves where all different indigenous populations were put together in one place, forced to live together, forced to speak a common language, and created a pan-indigenous movement that kind of united all the indigenous groups and created this contemporary Indian religion, which is now understood as a traditional millenary indigenous religion. But if you look at it, it's appropriation. So who is appropriating what from where and when? And this is like the, 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 the egg and the, the chicken, like what was born first? So I think that is more intellectually challenging and dynamic to think of multiple processes of transformation of culture. However, I do want to point out that we have to be critical to inequality and to certain disbalances in exchange and relationships. Not all exchanges are you know, between equal partners. When new age people are going to the Amazon interchanging with indigenous populations, you can say, 
culture is transforming, culture is happening, but you can also say there is a domination, you know, hegemony, uh, inequality, that some people are benefiting more in the exchange than others. Just to put it in very blunt terms, I have, for example, an indigenous friend in Brazil who went studying in Sao Paulo and he wanted to, to do high school and he didn't have a means of survival. So either he could go like be a gardener and make a minimum wage, or he could be a new age shaman in the weekends for the people of the university and make a living. And that was easier for him, but because he didn't have too many options, you know? So it was a paradox, these people wanted to help him, but they were kind of creating this, you know, uh, identity for him that he, it was not the identity he was more comfortable with. So these exchanges do involve power relations and inequalities and disbalances, which mirror larger unbalances that exist in our world. But I don't like the claim of authenticity and of purity, and these are the original ones and we stole from them. I don't like that line of reasoning very much as an anthropologist. Well, I just add that, um, I mean, there's a real reality behind your question which is that there's appropriation going on, literally, where they destroy the forests of these people, you know, and, 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 and for the sake of multinational agricultural companies or large farmers, you know, that kind of stuff is going on. We have to be very sensitive to it. Uh, cultural appropriation, we didn't appropriate it. They offer it to us. They, they say it's, the plants are coming north to help the north get healthier. We know how corrupt a lot of the ayahuasca world in Peru is with their ayahuasca tourism and sexual exploitation. It's not a pure world, and we're not, you know, and so, you know, and, and you know, I, I've had an experience of up here, a very famous, world, world famous, actually, shaman. He was quite powerful, actually, but when he led a ceremony here in Vancouver, he was in a church basement. And he talked for 10 minutes and he put on new age CD music for the next three hours. And then, and then some Beethoven and Wagner. Well, that was cultural appropriation. Whereas the Canadian born shamans that I work with, they chant in the original Shipibo language, which they learned by sitting in the jungle, being stung by mosquitoes and immersing themselves in rivers and going through dietas. So, you know, I think that behind your question there's a genuine respect for the, for 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 culture, but you know I, it's not as pure as as it might seem. And uh, you have to ask these, you know. And, and by the way, don't ask us. Ask the Aboriginal peoples how do they feel about Westerners using their stuff. Invariably, they say yes, it's a good thing. Well, well that's I mean, what they say, you know. So I don't know, you know. So. Uh, as a historian, I'd just like to say that um, <laughs> when we talk about peyote in particular, uh, if we actually locate ourselves back in the colonial period, what we see is that there were a number of sacred products, sacred European products and sacred Native American products, that were exchanged uh, in the early colonial period. When, when Europeans arrived in the Americas, they found peyote, they found oleoliki, they found, they found psilocybin mushrooms, they found, they found tobacco, they found chocolate. All of these things were sacred, or, and, and they, they were both sacred and profane. They, they circulated in a sacred economy, they circulated in a profane economy. And Europeans became very interested in all of them. In fact, when the Spanish Inquisition banned peyote, it didn't ban peyote for indigenous peoples, it was banning peyote for non-indigenous peoples because it was, it was out of a fear that a growing popularity of peyote among priests, among, among doctors, among, among slaves, among any number of other sort of colonial populations that were thought to be what they call people of reason or Christians. It was, it was, it was, it was coming in and threatening the kind of the, the, the religious order that the, that the Catholic Church uh, believed was absolutely essential to maintaining control in the colonies. And so, and so those bans were about the circulation of something into a European society. At the same time, things from European, European goods, commodities circulated into indigenous communities. The grain, olive oil, wine, any number, <coughs> any number of, uh, of, 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 of livestock animals became part of, became part of a world that was a very, a very diverse and a very mixed world. And so, so in a sense, when we talk about the current when we talk about the current uses 
um, the uses that, that, that Gabor is talking about, the uses that we, that we hear about when we talk about the New Age, uh, that, that, that we see when we see uh, Bia's film, we're, not, we're talking about something that is very old, not something that is very new. And what is very, very old is that non-indigenous people have consumed products with an origin in, in, the, in the indigenous past since the conquest. At the same time, indigenous peoples have consumed commodities that, are, that, 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 that have a European origin since the conquest. The, the, the crisis, and again, Bia sort of really uh, relates it, and, it's, and it's, very well, it's very well articulated in this text, is, is, a, is a contemporary crisis over the sustainability of a population, in part because, because non-indigenous peoples remain very interested in peyote for a variety of reasons. And there is a real concern on the part of conservationists, on the part of members of the Native American church, on the part of a member of the Wixarica peoples in, in Mexico, that, it, that, they, that these regions where the, where the peyote grows are in danger, and, and in danger from overuse, in danger from, from tourists, and of course, most recently in danger from Canadian mining companies. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's a question that that, has, that, that sort of in, interposes itself on this debate in a way that is, is difficult to, to resolve. And I think Bia sort of tried to say why it's difficult to resolve. Because when you have something that, is, that seems at risk, and peyote has been an endangered species in Mexico since 1991, when you have something that seems at risk, do you then say that people for whom it has a deep and important traditional role, and that's a very small group of people, the, uh, some Rarumara, some Kori, some Tapuana, some, some Wiharika in, in the western Sierra of Mexico. Do we say that only those people have a right to have access to this dwindling supply of plants? And if we do, are we saying that other people who also have had it circulate within their moral economies for centuries are no longer allowed? And I think the answer, I mean, I think we all agree that the answer to that question is difficult. It, I, I have an answer. I think the answer is cultivation, and I think the answer is you know it's 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 more more access. So if it we have little, we just have to create more. We could create incredible campaigns. We could give each children when they're born a peyote button, and you know you have a fund for college, and you have a peyote button you could take care of. There's multiple ways that we could you know have huge fields of peyote populations subsided by the state. We could have greenhouses. We have such a powerful economy. It was just not focusing on creating plants and making plants uh, sustainable. It's hard to grow in a way. In another way, it's not high, hard to grow. We're, we're just not mindset to have a proactive attitude about these species because we are always giving excuses that we use it and we're always trying to justify that it's not so bad. We don't have a culture that actually cultivates in, in large scale appreciates, understands, balances. And so I, I, this is what I'm calling the policy of stinginess. If I make $1,000 a month, I'm saving every, every little penny. If I make $10,000 a month, I can spend more. So I think it's the same thing with plants. Like if we have a problem of sustainability, let's just plant more. And let's regulate and think of mixed systems where we, some people would have access to the wild populations, others would have to create. That's what they're trying to do in Brazil with the ayahuasca churches. They, you know, if you want to harvest ayahuasca, you need to plant. You want to use this, you need to plant, you need to create a plantation. Maybe from some groups there's not an organic tradition of planting, but this has to evolve as well, I think, in a, in a world that you know, evolves and transform so that you know what I what I get what I get upset and what I think happens a lot is that people use the discourse of uh, either cultural appropriation or ecology which seem good causes to actually criticize the uses of that substances that they don't like so they instead of saying I don't like you and I don't like the way you use it you say well that's not ecological or that's appropriation but there's a lot of control over disputes of saying this is, you know, that use is wrong. So the reason of ecology has, has to be like also really balanced out because I think a lot of the discourse is claiming that the protection is the species, but in fact there is a dispute over what people consider right or wrong ways to use plants. Um, I just first wanted to thank you for being here. There seems to be a lot of passion and love for this kind of work that you're doing. It's really energizing to see that. Um, my question is, um, 
in the video, I think, is it Bia? Bia? Okay. Um, you mentioned, and I'm paraphrasing here, you said um, when you first used it, you got a sense of familiarity and that you went to a place um, that, you, that you already knew. Um, and this really caught me because this was the reason why I first used and then continued to abuse substances. Um, and towards the tail end of my substance abuse, I was you know, looking at ayahuasca and thinking, you know, this is too good to be true. Um, and then I had to kind of step back because my experience with psychedelics is that it took me into a really dark and dangerous place. Um, so I'm wondering if there's any kind of a screening process, if you have to look into the histories of people before giving them that. Um, and I know it's hard to do because we can't really do any studies on them right now. Um, or is it just as, as simple as having a guide, someone who's expert to take you through it? But well, look, so... Um there has to be a screening process, not for addiction history, so much as, uh, you know, I got an email the other day, somebody with paranoid schizophrenia, sh should they use ayahuasca? No, they shouldn't. It's going to trigger a psychosis, psychotic episode for which there's no container. If there was a container, six months, 12 months container, where they could be safe, that might be a good thing. Because you could work stuff some, some through me, some, Perhaps you could work some stuff through with the right guidance. But so that has to be a screening process. But in terms of addictions, um, if that's what your concern is, which just sounds like it is, is it? Um, but addictions are not, they're not to substances, specifically. They are to all pain, they are to altered states of mind that temporarily numb the pain that you feel. So, and I see you got a good book you're reading right there that <laughs> will tell you all about that. If it, yeah. Um, so, 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 given. Uh, so, what these plants can do for you is yes, take you to some very scary places. So they should. Because you've been running from that fear all your life. That's what the addiction is all about. Except you'll see those places in a setting where you're safe. The first time you saw those places, you were small and helpless. And there was no safety for you. So you started running. And many of us started running, and we're still running. But what if you could see those places in a safe context that illuminates the darkness. Because all darkness needs is light, and it's no longer dark. There's nothing wrong with the plants taking you to scary, painful places. That's where we want to take you. If it's in you, we want to take you there so that you can get into a different relationship with them. And that's not the same as using something to obtain your consciousness. This is to elevate your consciousness. Elevated consciousness means that you're going to experience things more deeply. That's a good thing. Again, you need the support and the guidance and the context for it. But an addiction history, far from prohibiting or inhibiting me from using the plants with somebody, would encourage me to use it with somebody. Now, you know, who the hell gets addicted to ayahuasca? I mean, you know, I'm not sure. That, you know, no, peyote can be used addictively, I know that. But again, I do think that that depends very much on context and who initiates you into the use of it and, with, and what intention you have in using it. So a bunch of young people getting together to use a substance in order to get some momentary release from their discomfort with themselves uh, with no guidance and no initiation, that's a very different process than that same substance being used with the intention of, of, of reality, with the intention of truth, with the intention of consciousness, with the courage to face the darkness, and under the guidance of people that know what they're doing. So I don't have that concern. Uh, Gabor mentioned that he doesn't think, you know, he could have his own experience and not do any research, and for him that's already validated. And what I have to, to tell Gabor is, and about this question is that ayahuasca is not addictive, but studying the plants is definitely addictive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And I think these plants are good for the soul, but they're good to think as well. What do you mean, do you mean addictive? You just can't stop doing it. No, you just want more and more. No, but, but do you have some negative consequences? <laughs> yeah, you get kind of obsessed in traveling and studying plants. And... Well, this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> I can help you. <laughs> um, you had mentioned... Um, Gabor, you had mentioned um, having a guide to walk you through it, and um, my understanding is that even maybe 40 years ago, um, like psilocybin mushrooms were something that people would travel to South America and do under the supervision of a shaman of some kind. And now, of course, um, we know that People can acquire them here, and they do them recreationally um, and with varying levels of maybe reverence for it. But um, I'm just wondering what you see as the future of the use of things like peyote and ayahuasca, um, and if people will, as it becomes more uh known about and more understood that people will start to be able to use it by themselves um without like a traditional supervisor or what or what do you what do you see as the future for the use of of these substances um, i see both i see people using them inappropriately and most of the time not with too much negative effect but no transformative effect either. And sometimes perhaps a negative effect. And I also see the growth of, 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 of the use of these plants in research, in therapy, in treatment, in spiritual exploration, under the right kind of guidance. So inevitably, when something spreads, you can't control its use. All the more reason that there should be some legal understandings of how to use them and, and, and some um, ways of, of protecting their use. But ultimately, it's going to go both ways. Uh, and I mean, and, you know, eight years ago, I was, the guy who first mentioned ayahuasca to me sitting in the room here. And uh, that was about nine years ago. And I had no idea what he was talking about. Who the hell could have imagined that I'd be working with it as much as I have since then? So it's changed. And, and not only that, I go anywhere now, and almost anywhere I go, somebody in the audience will ask me about ayahuasca, even though it's not like it's even a major thing that I work with it you know so so and people know about it and when I say ayahuasca a lot of these people start nodding their heads oh, oh. It, it, so yes it's spreading it, 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 it's burgeoning as a result of that you're gonna see both the misuse and the uh, and the valued use of it you're gonna see both Uh, hi, I'm an MA student in history here, and I'm doing some research on the early uses of psychedelics and scientific research. And I'm wondering why you get, why, um, so I'm looking at these documents from late 1800s where people are using mescaline, and that there's a lot of mescaline experiment. Fast, please. Oh, sorry, um, I speak really fast, I'm American, I guess that's why. Um, so, um, like for the first 50 years of research between the late 1890s and like the 1950s, mescaline was used pretty frequently in these experiments. I found like, I don't know, maybe like 50 or something. So I'm wondering why did mescaline sort of fall out of use recently and maybe during the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and LSD sort of took over after that point. So I'm sort of wondering why that happened and why mescaline is not more a part of like modern discussions about psychedelic research where MDMA and psilocybin and LSD are sort of taking the forefront there. I think that's a question for the historian on the panel. Thanks, Alec. <laughs> Thank you for your question. I, I can't really say much about what's going on now, but what I understood with uh, the folks who were looking at this in Saskatchewan was the mescaline supplies were much harder to get. They were quite unstable, they were expensive, and they changed a lot, um, at least in the supplies that they were getting. They were getting them mostly from German psychiatrists, and there was a, quite a lot of activity going on in the mescaline research in Germany in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, as I'm sure you know. Um, but what happened was when Sandoz was producing LSD originally, um, the supplies were quite stable, they needed small amounts, they traveled easily, um, and so the sort of commercial networks of LSD versus mescaline made LSD much more available 
It was also free for researchers who could claim through uh, their medical connections, but through Health Canada ultimately. Um, it, it was absolutely free. They didn't need a grant to get it either, and the mescaline they had to pay for. So I think, I think it gave uh, a boost to the LSD research at that time that then also ricocheted through other quarters. Uh, and of course, once that became known, it, there were, I think by 1961, there were a thousand peer-reviewed articles about LSD, and the number of articles on mescaline starts to go down. So I think it also had a kind of um, spiraling effect as more and more people started looking at this. There were minute doses, of course, could be used. So I think it also attracted a lot of attention for that reason. So, uh, so I think we have time for one more question. We had a question right here, and then... Um, yeah. This one's probably more directed for Gabor because of a, it's more direct for like neurology and cognition. I'm just curious, uh, in my, when I was in certain experiences, I've I've been overwhelmed by this one train of thought that I've only been able to externalize in a question, which is, what would happen if you ascribed, or you know, you constructed a word which ascribed a phenomena that had never been existed, and you somehow got the whole world to learn the definition of that word, and it regenerated? Would you almost, you know, change um, the way certain people might perceive something, right? And this is, uh, I like, I'm kind of saying this because of the, uh, you introduced with language, right? And I find that uh, really interesting, even thinking about certain experiments where they took healthy volunteers and put them in a uh, mentally schizophrenic ward and found that even professionals were able to diagnose healthy individuals with schizophrenia. Um, the book I was reading, Opening Skinner's Box, also talks about Bruce Alexander and his addiction studies. So the reason I have um, such strong feelings towards this is I've always been just humbled by the fact that I can come up with certain tangents from my own life that really parallel certain even like religious scriptures. I'm not trying to, you know, put myself up to them, sorry. I'm just trying to say how could you even, uh, how could you help people avoid confabulation so that they don't, you know, so that they don't self-diagnose themselves as like schizophrenic so that they can even take them, their own situation seriously if they don't have knowledge to, um, you know, like, I just find that these substances can be very dangerous for a lot of youth that take it unknowingly. And this can have very negative consequences for them, with their family, with school, with their, uh, with their own mental health. I'm wondering how um, yeah. uh, psychedelics in general, just LSD, um, psilocybin. Psilocybin, LSD, uh, yeah. Nobody here, I mean, I, I think you understand that. Nobody is advocating the use of any psychedelics, whether traditional, whether um, uh, you know, manufactured by untutored, unled uh, youth on their own. Nobody. So the issue is context. The issue is guidance. That's the issue. And in the 60s, the psychedelics were used very much in the former way, by uninitiated, untutored, unguided, unled young people. And there were a lot of tragedies. Well, but nobody's advocating that. And on the other hand, if somebody who shouldn't use it comes to me and the people I work with, will know that they shouldn't use it, most of the time. So there's a screening process which we mentioned before. Because even when I talk to certain professionals face to face, they seem to understand this gap. Why, have, why has it taken you know, me to have to go to university to understand these things? Right? Like I didn't learn this in school at a time when you know, this information would have been necessary. Well, yeah, yeah, well. Okay, did, did you, and, and, and did, you learn about, did you learn about mindfulness? Did you learn about the residential schools? Okay, no, so did you learn about um, uh, the mind-body unity in school? There's a lot of truths that are not taught in the schools. So if you're asking why are the schools ignorant, well, that's because schools are ignorant. And the educational system is ignorant, is ignorant. That's just how it is. And I don't mean to disparage anybody. I'm just saying, 
that's how it actually is. So, um, so. That's why we want to really thank UBC and thank Alec Dawson and thank our colleagues who are actually in the university doing this kind of research and all of you who are here. And, you know, there's a, I want to high, highly to encourage people to do this kind of research. It's a wonderful, you know, opportunity to expand this knowledge, to talk about it in ways that are meaningful and accessible. So, you know, there is a movement of people like us. Um, there's other people in sitting on, 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 on the public that actually should be on the panel. I think we should hear a little bit of them because they are here now. I just, I just want to say before I give the, the, the microphone over, my students who are here will attest to the fact that I do teach ignorance in my classes. It's <laughs> <laughs> My name is Mark Hayden. I'm the chair of the board of MAPS Canada, which is the multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies. And we promote a public discussion on psychedelics. And it happens in many different contexts. And this is one of the contexts that has been happening. So I'd like to thank everybody for showing up here and talking about psychedelics. It's interesting to hear what these folks are saying is the, our culture is evolving. I actually firmly believe what Bia said is we are being cross-pollinated by many other cultures who are bringing their wisdom to us. We're talking about it in many different contexts and our understanding of how we work with these sacred medicines is an evolving process that is happening here and now and today in Vancouver and Canada and across North America. It's really exciting and it's happening here in this room today. Thank you for being part of the discussion.